Welcome to the Profitable NDIS Provider Podcast, where we're joined by your hosts, Tanya Gomez and Paul Bryan. In each episode, we'll be sharing valuable insights and tips to help you turn your NDIS business into a profitable venture. So whether you're just starting out or looking to take your business to the next level, you've come to the right place. Let's stop surviving and start thriving. G'day and welcome to the Profitable NDIS Provider Podcast. My name is Paul and I'm joined with my amazing co-host, Tanya. Tanya, how are you going today? I'm wonderful today. All the better for seeing you, Paul. How are you oh, going? Really good, thank you. I'm really, really excited about today. Can you let us know what's going on? Yes, we have the Trout Brothers with us today. Yes. We have Jackson and Tommy Trout. So Tommy has been on our podcast a number of times, and as everyone knows, I'm the head of the Tommy Trout fan club. <laughs> um, and knowing that we were going to meet Jackson today, I hadn't met Jackson before, um, but Tommy said that I could never be the head of the Jackson Trout fan club because there's a line is too long out the door. So I'm really excited to chat to Jackson and um, hear a whole lot more about inclusive AF. Um, so I will introduce both Jackson and Tommy. Jackson is an animator, writer, and educator who weaponizes his autism, as he puts it, to deep dive subjects and their history. Every cool drawing you see on the Inclusive AF website is Jackson's. Awesome. Um, Tommy is an award-winning social entrepreneur in the disability, uh, sorry, and disability educator. He is also the founder of WeFlex and serves as an advisor to numerous social enterprises and charities. Welcome, Jackson and Tommy. Hello, uh, hello, everyone. Lovely to meet you all. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Awesome. So good to have you guys on. It was one of my favorite episodes chatting with you before, Tommy. And so I'm, I'm anticipating double the fun today with having you both on. Yeah, we, we, we brought the, uh, the poster boy of the enterprise here today with Jackie Boy. Thank you. So good. So good. Hey, could you tell us about Inclusive AF and, and what your vision is for this new business you're running? Sure, absolutely. So to be honest with you, when I left WeFlex, um, I started doing consultancy work and contractor work with a bunch of different people that reached out to me. And mm -hmm. um, I decided that I needed a trading name to be more professional. And so I landed on Inclusive AF because a lot of my stuff was just around inclusion and how to do mm -hmm. it and the rest of it. And you know, a lot of the time, sometimes the business stuff comes to you or the ideas come to you. And, you know, I was getting so many requests for education and for content. And can you please just teach us 101, just get us to a basic level of understanding. Yeah. And so we realized, you know, despite the work we did at WeFlex, which we're very proud of, there's a much broader uh, need of disability inclusion education um, in all of Australia for the most part. However, in particular, health and fitness, which is my background and my, my passion, as well as we're also looking at employment and employment outcomes for people with disability as well and the training required around that. So in a nutshell, we're here to support uh, Australia become inclusive, accessible and fun. That's really cool. Look, I'm going to poke the bear and I'd love to know what does inclusive AF mean as a name? So it stands for inclusive, accessible and fun. Awesome. And the reason why we wanted to go with that is because we decided that we really wanted to have a business that is exactly what it says on the tin and just yeah, this cool. is it, but also the extent to which we love the notion of inclusivity, you know, where we, we really believe that Australia and everything is at its best when everyone's there and able to be and bring their full selves to wherever they are. You know what I mean? The, the fitness and health industry is worse off for not having better representation and the same with employment. I mean, Jackie Boy is not just my brother, but he's also my favourite employee. That's and so good. Is he a good boss? That's, I think that's the main question we need to know. Well, well, technically, we're business partners now. That's what I thought, right? Yeah, yeah. But in the I'm past, he was an employee. How so good. That? I'm afraid to say my real <laughs> It's safe to talk, Jack. <laughs> You're the wonderful boss. I couldn't have a better boss if I wanted to. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. I guess for both of you, why are you so passionate about a more inclusive world? Well, because basically, you know, for even for self-interest almost, because like if people like making it, if in order for someone to make, for someone like me to be, you know, to be included and to be, be a part of the society, it's best to have everyone be accepted in society. 
because that way you can make it easier more accessible for everyone yeah no that's really cool that's pretty much it like you know for me for a lot of families out there you know we always even before we flex lifelong career in the industry families that i'd speak to it was always just constantly having to navigate world that isn't built for their kids it isn't mm. built for their brothers or sisters or even their parents and so it's not just the injustice or the shittiness of that, but again, everything is worse off. We believe that inclusivity is actually a great way to drive a lot of positive outcomes for everybody. It makes everything yeah, better. Really. I know we've spoken to a lot of providers who are really, they maybe even started their business because they wanted things to be more inclusive, maybe for their own children or for their own family, that sort of thing. But they really get stuck, I think, making it happen or you know, once you get into, you know, the NDIS mold, you know, there's only so much you can do. So it's I tough. think what you guys have got here is really powerful. It's it's tough. Um, I was lucky in that I had Australia's greatest NDIS expert and consultant there uh, to support me. Even, even without the angelic Tanya Gomez guiding me, you know, I had a full head of hair when I started. <laughs> <laughs> with the NGIS. <laughs> I don't know how Jack has kept all of his. It's very stressful. And also the inclusion itself is not a particularly binary measurement. Like how would you describe inclusion? What would be your definition of it? I, I would hazard a guess at this point because I'm, you know, if I fit into a mold myself, how am I going to be able to explain that effectively? I think that if you can make sure that, you know, everybody is is feeling included but how do you measure that how do you make sure that actually happens and how to turn that into a rule that you can actually yep. supply yeah. can you yeah. have a definition without it being tokenistic too right like there's yeah. lots of times in my life i've been invited to something to be the token woman at the table as an example <laughs> and you know also at times when i did international education i was invited to things because i was white and you know again that was a ticket of the box as opposed to truly being there and very often it was like yes we know you're smart but just sit there and be quiet and be a woman and be white and it was like yeah okay i can do those things but that's surely not how i got into the room right <laughs> Um, so I, I think it's it, tokenism is also really a challenge. And that's why personally, I really struggle with, and I know this is something you do really well um, at Inclusive AF is the idea of, of imagery and representation in images. And I really struggle with stock images and, and using images. Even mm. I don't really like using images with people with disability in them at all, because I feel like I feel very much that they're going to be tokenistic or it's not going to represent them in the right way. And I'm totally worried about not being politically correct at the same time. And so all of those things together kind of forms this inaction. Um, and you've taken that the opposite way. You've gone, okay, well, we don't like stock images. We want everyone to be represented. So you went and did amazing photo shoots that include everyone. And, and mm. you made that a pillar you stand on instead of, the vast majority of me who just puts our head in the sand and says, this is way too hard. I'm just going to opt out of this. But yeah, it's, it's tough. You know, the, it, it's about the, the definition of inclusion that we've probably landed on for the most part, the feel fits for the most part is treating everybody the same, unless there's a good reason not to. And the good reason not to is what you have to debate in your head. So an example could be, um, I, I bring Jack along to a party and I introduce Jack and I say, he's my brother, Jack, he's autistic. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't tell anybody else, anyone else's medical condition or condition or whatever. I'd just say, here's so-and-so, but I've made a different rule for Jack. And now, is there a good reason to do that? Probably not. So that's mm -hmm. not inclusive, right? And so it's always treating everyone the same unless you have a good reason to. So another example, an easy one would be, you know, if I'm planning a night out and I've got a mate in a wheelchair, I'm going to actually choose places that are wheelchair accessible. I wouldn't do that for everybody, but in this case I would, and there's a good reason to do that. So that's always been our definition is treat everyone the same yeah, right. unless you have a good reason not to. And the good reason not to is actually yeah, how you have to challenge yourself on why am I doing this? And is this actually necessary and a good idea? So again, the same with the photos, like would you use stock imagery for other customer types? Probably. Should you do it the same? Or is there a good reason to not want to use stock imagery for disabilities? And for us, we thought, yeah, we actually don't think it's, we, we, we think really clear representation is very important because there's not much out there. Um, and that's what we sort of, why we focus on that. And we'll, get, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do more photo shoots in the future for sure. Because there's yeah. uh, the stock imagery 
um, in this world is pretty, pretty bad at the best of time. Yeah. Yeah. And in the meantime, you're making up for that with, with Jackson just doing all of the artwork and actually drawing mm. pictures. Yeah. yeah. One of the reasons why we like the drawing is because I, I can just get exactly what we need immediately. <laughs> I don't have to organize a big photo shoot in three weeks time to get a photo. Like I could just get Jack draw this. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in Jackson's experiences in, in employment. I know I've, I've heard that you've had a bit of a, uh, a journey with employment, which has also been one of the reasons for setting up inclusive AF. Yep. That's, that's pretty unlikely. Okay. So, uh, when I first began like going into DS, DES, 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 this was like back during like 2014 to like 2016, like, you know, uh, like three years that were pretty hectic. Like when I first began, it was based. Sorry, anyway, so, uh, when I first began, like the job that they were sending me to, like they were like bottom of the barrel kind of jobs. They weren't like, you know, good kind of jobs. They were like organic ve vegetable and fruit stands that were like, you know, miles out of town or miles out of city. And the places that were pretty in hindsight, pretty damn dodgy. For instance, one of the places I went to, they were running a puppy mill operation where they were selling like puppy Jack, uh, puppy Jack Russell's out of a box out of a vegetable sandwich. I'm thinking to myself, you know, I thought to myself, I didn't think of it any time because I didn't know, didn't know about the rules until I was confronted by a very concerned, angry citizen. That's when I realized, like, oh, wait, this is not, a, this is not okay. <laughs> I thought to myself, why would they send me here? Then another time I was completely shortchanged for numerous months by my employer that DES, DES got me. And we had to go to the, we had to take him into law. We had to take him into the court. And when we confronted the DES provider saying, hey, this person's been shortchanging me, I thought they would be like, hey, we're going to you know, go into this and you know, get to the bottom of it. They didn't do it. And I thought to myself, that's a bit complicit. And another time, and this really has set into my head since, I got another job at a vegetable sand. And there was another person who had a, I would say a little bit more severe intellectual disability or whatever, whatnot. And he suffered a major injury on his foot. And it wasn't like, you know, a bruised, you know, scraped knee or anything. It was like something penetrated his foot and half his foot was like drenching with blood. It was bleeding. And I thought to myself, I didn't see a single first aid stand or first aid kit. No one was applying anything. No one was like, let's, you know, uh, take to move the sock you know, put dental and put a bandage on or get him home. It was like, it was basically told to wait till the blood stops bleeding, but wait, wait till the bleeding stops, then get back to work. And I thought to myself, this doesn't feel right. In hindsight, I'm like, what the hell? Like going back, I'm like, and the thing is, I didn't complain at the time. I didn't say anything because I was under the assumption that the economy must be so bad that this must be like the only places they could find me. Mm. That's why I, that's why I say silent. That's why I never asked or questioned saying, Hey, how come, you know, why, why am I only getting these kind of jobs? Like I'm not, I'm, I understand I'm not going to get the, you know, fancy, you know, six figure jobs. I mean, I was only in my twenties at the time. I understood that, but I thought to myself, like, you know, could you at least got me like I don't know, a job at like a nice Coles or Woolworths or something sex stocking stuff like that's that kind of job. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you know, because previously, like before that I had two other jobs and they were, I've got them through family friends and they were very easy very enjoyable jobs. They weren't like, you know, high society stuff, but they were pretty like, you know, decent. I thought to myself, how come friends and families are more likely to get me a really good job while a, you know, an, a professional, a professional service. service, that whole mm. point of employment is getting me like jobs that like literally like, I'm sorry, but they are bottom of the barrel stuff. And I'm like, why, why like, I that's don't the best I could do. That's the best I could do. And I, and I didn't say anything because I thought I had two assumptions. One, like I said before, that the economy must be so bad that these are the only jobs available. And two, that these guys must be so underfunded that this is the best they can do. Maybe I, maybe I assumed the best of them. I thought maybe they, they must be, you know, they must be trying so hard. And I'm like, then I found out that, you know, they get so much more money. They could have got me a but like even a more decent job, but no. The big one was that they didn't really ask Jack about his interests or passions. Like yeah, yeah. if you see Jack's illustrations, you'd know that all kinds of marketing and advertising agencies or creative agencies would love that type of ability, you know, and yet they're sending him to fruit marts in the middle of nowhere on a Sunday morning, which requires mm. like two hours of planes, trains and automobiles to get there. And so, yeah. you know, we, we, we love Des. We think it's so important. We think it's such a, there's, there's fewer ways to 
actually improve or, you know, improve the outcomes of people with disability than employment. We just sort of were taken aback by the level or the standard of quality of service delivery and the lack of resources out there. And, you know, <clears throat> like a lot of things, there's no booklet for families or for young people with disability going into the workforce. Like, this is normal, this isn't normal. You're just going off what you see and you're going off what you're told. And you kind of feel like if Des says me, it must be legit. It must yeah. be a decent place. And a proper yeah. agency with a, with, with a brand name and professionals said this was okay. So a lot of funding. I mean, like, and yet they sent me to a place that's having a God damn puppy moth, for God's sake. Yeah, I mean, legal activities. Yeah, and that's been shortchanged. And, and the mere fact that, like, I was being shortchanged and I, we kind of told them this, you would think that they would be, like, the first ones saying, oh, we're so sorry for this. We'll, we'll solve this immediately. Nothing. It's also not like you were paid much. <laughs> yeah. that, that's a big part of the why of the mm. side of inclusive AF is because, but the issue is, is that, you know, I go, you, you talk to anyone in this industry and you mention devs, you're going to get a lot of different reactions, but you'll always get a reaction to it. Like it's a loaded concept and term. Yeah. Yeah, I have so many questions on that. I'll try not to go too political with my views on Dez, <laughs> but um, trying to stay on topic. It, tell me about your creative agency side of things, because that really is kind of like mm. the solution here, isn't it, to the whole Dez issue? One, one of them, for sure. So Inclusive AF itself just does education for health and fitness, but also for employment. But then we've got the – so at the moment, we're, we're going to be calling it Disbranded we can get the trade get the trading name for that but essentially what we're looking to do is we believe that in the disability industry you know we, we think that the branding is quite weak not particularly clear not very compelling there seems to be some sort of mandate where you have to have the word ability or care in your name um, which we think you know and it's like we're, we're not against those words we just think they're overplayed quite a lot and once upon a time you know i would have been not anti-branding but i would have seen that as complete wank like Oh, God, your brand. You know what I mean? Who cares about the brand? But as a business owner, I've realized just how important brand is, what it means. But I look at, you walk through a disability expo, and if you were an alien coming to Earth, going through that expo, what would you think of the people that they're marketing to? And you'd think that they're all idiots and that they're all the same person. You know what I mean? Like everything is the same, same message, same branding, a very Mickey Mouse. And so for us, we were like, you know, wouldn't it be cool if, as a young person with a disability, you walked through those expos and all the brands were super hip, really cool, not about the disability, but about the service and the outcomes and aspirational and the rest of it. You know, one of the biggest outcome, one of the biggest things we have with WeFlex is we invested a lot into building a good brand with it. And really quickly, you know, everyone was sort of always saying, we love your brand because of what it stands for. And we love your brand and what you actually, how you approach the topic, how you engage with it, how you talk. It's so cool. And what, you know, the mark of success for us. And one thing I wanted from day one was I really wanted our, our participants, our clients to be so in love with our brand that they want to wear the merch and want to buy merch. Right. And they did. So people would sell, you know, people would buy our hoodies and buy our shirts because they love the brand so much. And I don't know many NDIS providers that can say that their participants yeah. nag them to buy merch with their logo on it and yeah, wear it yeah. out in public. Yeah. And we thought that was like the the mark of approval from the community that like, yeah, we're cool. Yeah. I, th I think WeFlex did that particularly well. Absolutely. I think there's there's another provider, I don't know if you've heard of them, Tommy, called Paylos in Victoria. You, you mentioned the them and I haven't, but I need to look them up. They sound awesome. They are awesome. So what they do is that they have one business card, which is for the participant that doesn't mention disability anywhere. They have 12 super cool, big black four wheel drives. So their branding is all around their cars and they take young, young boys, mostly out camping and four wheel driving and fishing. And then they have one card that mentions the NDIS stuff for support coordinators or parents, but all of their advertising is directed at their client who is mostly the participant or the person with disability and they call it so social work under in disguise which is all about you know they they do fishing right, and while they're fishing they're, they're hell yeah Tom that's so good to talk through things that's they, so smart. They, they do it quite spectacularly and that is an amazing brand um as well so you could yeah have, i can introduce you if you don't I, know literally. yeah no we love that stuff and you know for us the one thing that we really like uh, so, so an example i'll give that i, I think is really perfect or sums this up is that 
there's a organization that does mentoring for younger people and so sort of like you know like big brother big sister type stuff at schools mm -hmm. and they have these, all these bus ads out at the moment and the bus ad sort of says help at risk teens discover their purpose or some shit like that and my nephew actually had to do that once uh, a few uh, two years ago and i just thought it was funny that like he goes he sits at those bus stops and when he looks at the brand it's not talking to him it's talking about him and it's talking about him like he's got problems yep. and that he's a loser you know what i mean like he's disadvantaged and you're this and you're that and it's talking to the donors not to the actual participant so when he's obviously not excited to go and do that program and he's like cringing at it and just knows he's gonna cop shit from his mates so yeah it's because your branding is just, is targeted and talking to the wrong people and the message is all wrong like no one wants to be a part of that you know what i mean it becomes like a mandatory sentence and not a program that they're excited by yeah right so um, i think there's a real big split in the industry at the moment so many providers we, we see it time and time again you're 100 right everything looks the same it's it's careability support services and i apologize if that is actually somebody's name it is it's it has become very generic and cut and you know cut and paste and what what you're talking about here i think our listeners can get, get a hold of this idea of who who are we talking to who is the actual user of our services and what outcomes they're looking for as you talk about you know building your brand around what they're actually looking for, not what a support coordinator wants to see on a piece of paper when you email them. Yeah, exactly. Um, but also like, you know, support coordinators and mum and dad aren't stupid. They, they can read yeah. through the lines and what you're about. If exactly. You just talk to the participant, no one else all the time. It's not like a support coordinator is not going to be able to work their, wrap their head around what you're talking about. Like they know exactly what you're talking about and they're going to look for that. If anything, if you're talking to the concerns of the participant, those participant is voicing those concerns to the support coordinator. So they can still put one-on-one -on -one together, you know, but it just makes it so much easier for that support coordinator to sell any service into a family or into a participant's life. If when they show them, it's all about the participant's needs, concerns, and it's a cool looking thing. You know what I mean? They're like, yeah, that looks really yeah. fun. I, I want to do that as opposed to talking about them, not to them. So could you tell us a bit about the history of disability course you guys have put together? This looks really cool. So before Jackie Boy go, launches in, the reason why we did it was because when I was when I, I was doing a lot of work out when I left WeFlex asking about inclusion, and what I found was I kept having to refer back historically to certain things. So um, you know, there, there's a culture, or there's cultures within disability. Why is that? Well, actually, you have to understand where things have come from. You know, over the mm -hmm. last few decades and even centuries, and it got to the point where I, like if if I had to do an hour workshop explaining disability 101 to a group. I'd end up spending about almost half of it on the history. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought, you know what, I, we just need to teach this outright. And Jack is a huge archival history nerd like me, but not the archival stuff, but history for sure. And Jack just deep dove it, you know, and just came awesome. up with some amazing nuggets, which, you know, Jack can talk about. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So I basically, I did a huge short term deep dive into the history of disability in Australia. And I was very fascinated by like the trajectory of like how it kind of explains like kind of like uh, the modern day world of disability in a sense like for instance like one of the things i've noticed is that there's a kind of a, a recurring theme in the history of disability is that basically it's an acknowledgement that like while there is definitely you know impairments and how it can affect as you know personal disability person, the one thing i discovered is that the push the history of it is basically it's a struggle for self-determination and independence while while acknowledging that you know you while acknowledging that impairments can cause can disable you but most of the point it's the society in itself that disables somebody hence like there's also a, we also have a course on the history of the social model talking mm -hmm. about how it's more society that it creates the disabilities rather than the impairments like a person in a wheelchair like you know his impairment is only a disability if there's no accessibility in a sense like if you can't access the top floor because there's no elevator or ramps, then technically his impairments disables him. But if he can get up to the top of the stairs, you know, perfectly fine with the elevator or, you know, a ramp, then his impairments does not disable him because he can still do his job. Yeah. Anyway, so basically from what I, what I see is that the history of disability in Australia, it kind of begins with like, you know, uh, acknowledging that people with certain impairments both mental and physical kind of began with a sense of we need to treat these people as in institutions to care for them and to basically, you know, 
basically say like, you know, they can't function in society due to the disability. This is the medical model. So people who were, who had mental disabilities or people with mental illnesses were confined to asylums. In the late 19th century, there was a royal commission that basically decided that we need to split the two. The people with mental illnesses and people with mental disabilities were combined through different spaces. One was the, possibly the first around the world, the first asylum for mentally disabled children around the world, the first, the first time from what we understand, and it was called the Q uh, Idiots Ward. That was considered the politically in, uh, politically correct terminology. The, oh, wow. Yeah. What were the other what were the mentally unwell people called? Oh, yeah, they're called uh, lunatics and... Lunatic wards. Lunatic wards and such, yeah. There's even policy called the Dangerous Lunatics Act in the 30s. That was around the ability to basically take them and put them into asylums, essentially, if they were considered dangerous. Anyway, mm -hmm. while at the same time, in the 19th century, due to the Industrial Revolution, industrialization of society, people who had physical disabilities, not mental disabilities, but physical disabilities, were kind of left to dry, in a sense, because technology had kind of made some of them... They couldn't work. They couldn't really work, and they couldn't really participate in society due to, one, inaccessibility, but also because, like... You know, because farming life, basically, or family farming and such, agricultural such, like, kind of made them redundant in a sense. And as a result, a lot of charities, uh, benevolent, benevolent ladies societies, charities mm -hmm. came about that basically said, let's create uh, special homes and places for the care of people who, due to their disability, physical disabilities, can't participate in society. So we'll give them perpetual care and, you know, you know take care of them in a sense. Again, this is operating under the medical model disability which basically says that the impairments are based people with impairments are basically broken they need to be basically cared for they need to be perpetually mm. sick they, they need to be hospitalized for their entire lives anyway so this continued until the early 19th century when so world war one soldiers came back and you know some of them do had this you know were disabled or impaired due to you know, combat and there was a rehabilitation program to help to treat them and when these came up, a lot of people who already had disabilities basically said, we want the same thing. We want to be rehabilitated. We want to yeah, be so given. They get to get, so they get treatment in the community that we get. Yeah. We yeah. both have a physical disability. Why is that? And same thing happened after World War II. It sort of reached crisis point really from a um, capacity standpoint is that even more veterans are coming back and there's just not enough institutions in Australia to hold them. Mm. And that's sort of where that happened, you know, then institutions and so there's an amazing one of the cool things about the history course you see all these heroes you had no idea existed in australian history one of them for us that we really love is john rorty um who was a guy who was in institutional care and was able to basically get the word out um do you want to talk really quickly okay. so about basically john rorty uh, he had basically like cerebral palsy and such and was certainly confined to a wheelchair he complained about the, you know, lack of freedoms and restrictive nature of these institutions. And he, you know, got word out to the media and he wrote a very influential book called Captives of Care, which basically just said like these institutions, you know, while people think that they're benevolent and care for people, what they really do are basically just like, and we're, we're like prisons, like people with disabilities, like we want to be able to be, have freedom to, you know, basically be able to live on our own and, during this time, during the 1970s, this was the era of the disability rights movement around the world. And this was also the era where the social model began to emerge, where it's basically said, we don't want to be institutionalized. We want to participate in society. And the only way to do that is to make society more accessible. By getting rid of the disability that society places on us, with you know, we people with impairments, only then can we participate in society and therefore not be, you know, technically a burden for the state, almost. Mm. We can be you know, full-fledged citizens. All you have to do is just make it a little bit more accessible. For instance, people in wheelchairs, we can participate just as well as everyone else if you just make the ramps, if you just make, you know, rooms accessible. By blocking us, you're making us quote-unquote disabled. By excess, making it accessible for us, we're not disabled, in a sense. Yeah. Mm. That's and fantastic. This, oh, sorry. And this continued onwards, this thinking and this movement continued into the late 80s with the Hawke government introducing the 1986 Disability uh, Services Act and the 1992 Disability Discrimination Act. <laughs> and after this, in the 90s and early 2000s, people with impairments began to basically bring lawsuits and complaints. Yeah. As a result, you know, buses became more accessible for people in wheelchairs. 
mm. places became more accessible for people with wheelchairs. Telecommunication companies began making accessories for people who have hearing and uh, Maybe cinemas that have yeah. mm-hmm. closed captions. So essentially what happened was like, one thing that we, we really try to impart to people though is that the impact of institutionalization, like it's it's in living memory. These are a lot of people who are still alive who are in the captives of care style of institutions, right? So yeah. and only since the seventies of people with disabilities really been able to influence their own policy and influence everything around them. Everything's been about them until recently. And so what happened was in the 90s when they passed the Disability Discrimination Act, meaning only in 92 did it become illegal to discriminate based on disability, which means that in the 80s you could do that legally. Essentially what happens is that you have like, a, it still happens now, but you have like a decade of just lawsuits because they're like, well, it's legal for you to do that. And then the entire world, but all of Australia got held accountable essentially over the course of a decade as they just repeatedly used that Discrimination Act to say, I'm on the bus list of this, I want that. You can't you can't deny me on that, and that's how society just had to grapple with it, you know. And all those people who brought those lawsuits forward were really advancing the cause and making life yeah. so much better for everybody who came after them. So a lot of the times, people think, "Oh, they're a litigious group," but like this is why, like because, like you know, yeah, yeah, the, le- the legislation isn't that old. A lot of places still break it. We need to hold everyone accountable. This is the rule. That's brilliant. Super interesting, right? Yeah, yeah, that's precedent. But also, more importantly, the history of disability, from what I've really truly understand, is that it's really it's it's a yearning for the people who are the parents to basically say, "Listen, I don't want to be you know a charity case. I don't want to be like I don't want I don't want people go you know looking at me with pity and thinking they need to take care of me. I want to take care of myself. I want to if you just make it just slightly more accessible. If you just let me just be who I am. If you just let me just you know participate in society." If you just get rid of any hurdles that get in my way, you know, any small things like, you know, an accessibility, like a ramp or, you know, whatnot, I can participate fully and I want to. Yeah, like, so, you know, one thing that we've always railed against is the special everything, special places for special people and there's same, same, but different, same, same, but still other, right? And so at the moment, you know, we're, we've moved past the more black and white systemic issue. There's laws now, there's rules around it, but now there's cultures and society is trying to sort of grapple and keep up and manage it. And inclusion is very different. So some people might see, you know, to- we, we, we're going to put a board, board seat aside for someone with a disability to sit on it, or a woman to sit on it. And it's like, okay, like for some people that's truly inclusive and for others, it's absolutely not and misses the point entirely. And, you know, for us, our perspective has always been, you know, the, you know, so a lot of people, you know, sport tries to be really inclusive. And what they do is like at, at a sporting event at halftime, they'll bring out one person with a disability. And for us, we cringe because we're like, you're just making a show out of them. It's not, they're not inclusive if everyone's just staring at them. You know what I mean? Like inclusion is just them in the crowd. Or again, same, it, it, treat everyone the same unless there's a good reason not to. So that's sort of where, you know, we're, we're glad that we're, we're getting better. I agree. I think this stuff is all part of that. And so with inclusive AF, one thing we really want to do is just drive home the issue that like no one in the, like our experience, we've been co-designing and managing and talking to the disability community for years and years. And we're part of the disability community. We've never asked for special treatment. We don't want special treatment. Just treat us the same. You know, that was always the big thing at WeFlex is, oh, are you special gyms? Like, no, like no one wants that. No one's ever asked for that. They all want to go to the local gym. Hmm. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, easier not to. Look, it's again, a lot of people in the industry, they were around in the 70s and 80s. You know, like attitudes have been changing so quickly, you know, that you, even in the NDIS, you've got just tiers of workers from different generations with radically different perspectives and attitudes on disability care and what inclusion is and proper support, the rest of it, you know, um, which is, yeah a really big, big issue that we have to sort of get with, but I think we're slowly getting better. But the issue with co-design and why we've always been really big on that is that we've realized that we've gone from the point where we have to listen to the voice of disability. Now we're at the point of voice says, because we've been in it so long, we've realized that there's almost no perspective held by all people with disability. Like it's so individual that we really find it hard to think of any rules or, you know, guidelines or language or anything, because, you know, if they ask people with, um, people in the autism spectrum, how they like to be referred to. And the answers were completely all over the shop. 
Like some people love people some people are fine with just being called autistic. Some people prefer being called on the spectrum. Even though Asperger's isn't a condition, isn't technically exist anymore, there's so many people who demand to be referred to as Asperger's or Aspie, right? Mm. And I think that's going to be very hard for people to grapple with, that there isn't the single rules or the single thing, the one thing is a simplification of it. But the more we engage with all these different perspectives, the more you're going to realise that it's actually about just meeting the needs of one person, not everyone, as you meet them and as you deal with them. Yes, it annoys me. Like a lot of new people come into disability, a lot of saviors come into disability industry, you know, either later in life or they just decided that they're going to be the ones to solve it. But all they try and do is simplify it, right? And it's just people are so uncomfortable with the idea that this is inherently complicated, period. It's not simple. Done. And like you're not so effing smart that you have actually solved everything and made it a single thing. Like every single person, think about all the different disability types, all the different manifestations of all those different disability types, all the different personalities that they're attached to, all the different ethnicities, all the different genders, all the different orientations, and in society at the different times, even in the different geographic areas of Australia. And you're going to tell me one rules or certain rules apply to everybody, right? No, mm -hmm. like inclusivity, stuff like that, the opportunity, 100%. But from there, you're on your own. You've got to just talk to the individual, service the individual's goals like you would anybody else. I think when it comes to, <laughs> Jack looks at me immediately because this is what I answer. So the immediately, the big thing is, is if you've got participants, how well do you know them and how many times have you really spoken to them about not only what they want, but their perspective on your business and their experiences? A lot of the times, you know, providers often focus on next customer. You know what I mean? Like it's always growth, yeah. growth, growth, and more, 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 which, you know, we're all for, go for that. But, you know, if you've got 20 participants and you've got, You've got co-design panels right there. And it's not, you don't have to overcomplicate it. It's not like there's a series of questions you have to ask in a certain order to get the right data. You can just say, can I bring five or 10 of you in for a coffee? I want to ask you a bunch of dumb questions and I really want you just to give me honest answers and help me understand where we're at and just get them to rank all the different aspects of your business, all the different service provision and just really bring them in. And you'd be surprised. Like we ran co-design sessions at Reflex and I was always scared that like, I'm going to, I just know I'm going to piss someone off. Like I'm going to just say the wrong thing. And you know, you know me, I talk fast. I, I don't always think in advance, you know? Um, and so I'd bring in people I hadn't met before either, prospective customers, and there'd be 10 of them. And I'd just say straight off the bat, look, you know, I'm one, they, they knew why they were there, but I said, look, I really want to ask you a bunch of questions. A lot of these questions are going to be really stupid. The reason why is because i like, I believe education starts at zero and you develop from there. So I'm going to ask you really basic questions. I don't mean anything by it. And I just need really honest answers so that I can then teach that and do that in the business. And I just asked them and, you know, they actually, there was never any problems. They actually said, we love that you're asking basic questions because that's actually what most people get wrong hmm. is basic stuff, you know, and stuff that we wouldn't think about. So an example is when we were doing blind low vision, you know, I asked them and they said, you're missing the biggest thing or one of the biggest things for us. And I said, what's that? Like consent to touch. And I said, do you have any idea what it's like when you're blind to be grabbed by somebody when you're not expecting it? Mm. It's really, really confronting and you don't know who it is. There's so many problems with that. And there's stories about people being led across the street by a good Samaritan, but they're being led across the wrong street. You know what I mean? So they've now got to go back. <laughs> they're disoriented and it's a real pain in the butt for them. And I said, you know, make consent a really big deal. Um, and that's something, you know, as a full seeing person, I never thought about and I wouldn't have included if I didn't ask. And so like, that's so, yeah. Jesus Christ, how embarrassing for me, I missed that. And we put it in, a huge part of our education and all, all the people, all our clients who are blind low vision said, we love that. These PTs are actually really upfront about consent to touch every single time, right? So that, that was something that made us stand out something that we wouldn't have gotten unless we spoke directly to people. Yes, Jackie boy. A great way to, to see it is like for a lot of, uh, you know, impairments and disabilities, like a lot of it is something that any one of us can one day be susceptible to. Like one of us could one day just lose our hearing. One of us, if any of us can easily lose our sight one day or be confined to a wheelchair, either being you know, halfway through halfway, you know, half paralyzed or full paralyzed. Yeah. The question is like a great way to see is, if you were in that position, how would you like to be treated? Mm. That's a great way to see it because then you can think to yourself, you know what, if I would really like to, you know, you know, X, Y, Z, 
there's a really good chance that this other person who has who already has this, this impairment will also be likely to treat it that way. Mm. True. We know a few people who have become disabled through an accident or through a, a, a condition. And so they've said, we've lived life not disabled and disabled. Yeah. And some of them, it's purely physical disability. And they're like, it's amazing how our society just trims 20 IQ points off you immediately the second you're in a wheelchair. Yeah, no, it's it's one of those questions that, I, you know, from a, from a business standpoint, providers really need to be looking at this because, you know, as we mentioned before, it's it's very much same, same. There, there's, you know, there's compliance things around, you know, making sure that you're, you know, you've got co-design. But when it comes down to it, how much, are, you know, at, for our listeners right now, how much are you actually asking the participants that you're working with at the moment, the people who are literally making your business run, are you asking them, are you having the conversations, are you making sure that, yeah, we're actually doing what is need to be done or, we're, you know, what we're missing the mark here, this is how we could improve because we just had a conversation. And I think you brought up a really good point there is that most businesses are looking for the next client. Um, if, if businesses were able to put as much effort into, you know, engaging with their current clientele and making sure they're happy and making sure that they're part of their, their design process and their service design process, I think that would be a massive advantage for any provider just wanting to stand the test of time and actually create results. Yeah. No, it's um, we will put it to you that we never received any fi negative feedback about being constantly asked for input. No yeah. one ever came back and said, "Can you stop asking my, me about my kids' needs?" You know what <laughs> I mean? Like they were always like, "Thank you for asking. This really helps." So yeah. you know, yeah. I think, but you know, a lot, a lot of they they consider it to be a bit of a luxury when it isn't. It's pretty vital to be. You know, I think I think we I think good businesses are obsessed with their customers. Mm. And customers are the ones who are giving you money, not the ones who might. So mm -hmm. you've got to just be obsessed with your customers. And that was something, and that's something we've always been, which is really obsessed with our customers. Yeah, absolutely. Look, guys, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute blast chatting with, with you, Jack, and also with you, Tommy. I think that, as I said, a lot of providers could really take this information today and, and look at what they're doing. I think it's a great opportunity for each provider to evaluate where they're at um, you know, take five minutes and go, oh, what are we doing to make sure we're actually hitting the mark here? And what, what can we be doing to do better? Um, I'm going to take a second, absolutely plug the um, history of disability course, because I learned so much in that 10 minutes or so. <laughs> I'm going to need to dive into that further. I will give you access, Paul. I'd love for you to do it. Oh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very keen. Look, Thank you so much for joining us, guys. We really, really appreciate it. Everybody else listening, we have got another fantastic episode up for you next fortnight. We'd love for you to join us, and we will see you again next time we're on air. Anytime. Thank you. See you. Guys. See ya. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Profitable NDIS Provider Podcast with Tanya Gomez and Paul Bryan. We hope you found today's episode informative and valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to subscribe, leave us a rating and share it with others who could benefit from our insights. Until next time, keep thriving.